I received a video response to my Christian challenge from a user by the name of Enoch 2. He perceived the repercussions of the wrong answer to my challenge and set out to answer it. If you haven't seen my Christian challenge video, he rather eloquently fleshes it out here. Um, Christians say that uh, atheists you know, have no basis for any kind of morality. It's just a morality of convenience or personal uh, choice. He says, well, uh, what happens to a Christian? I mean, what kind of judgment are they going to suffer um, or punishment if they have a moral lapse and if they fall into sin? Now, what I get as the, the, the real meaning of this question is he obviously has some understanding of Christianity and he understands that Jesus Christ died for our sins so that now if we put our trust in Christ our sins are forgiven so therefore since my sins are forgiven um, what is keeping me from just sinning without repercussions so I guess he's kind of turning around the, the usual argument against atheism uh, uh, on Christians and saying well really it's, it's you guys who are uh, who can sin if you want to without um, responsibility or repercussion uh, without potentially even guilt so what's to um, restrain you from sinning perhaps even worse than, than atheists or just anybody else um, because then you know you could say well Christianity then is really just um, a cover which you know for, for which allows immorality while claiming to be extremely moral when they go before their Lord on the day of their deaths what's going to happen to them essentially what is God going to do with them you find his video link in the description box below you can watch there and come back here to watch me rip him a gaping new one you can stay here and take it all in so let's take a gander at what he had to say my sins are forgiven and yes if I have moral lapses as you said I'll still go to heaven but I will suffer I will still go to heaven but I will suffer I want you all to remember those words because they become very important further on in the video my sins are forgiven and yes if I have moral lapses as you said I'll still go to heaven but I will suffer after hearing him say this you may be jumping out of your seat to ask him there's suffering in heaven the, now the thing that I notice when this has happened in the past, the thing that I notice most particularly is that some of my work can be uprooted. Some of the spiritual work that, that has been going well and that I've been doing in the spirit of the, of the Lord, it can be uprooted and sort of burned up. And so that effort comes to nothing. Some of his spiritual work can be uprooted, burned up meaning his efforts in the name of his Lord are an insurance policy against his sins. God has a scale up in the big blue wing, the good stuff you do for it, according to Enoch 2, against the sins you commit. As long as your good deeds, helping out an old lady across the street, outstrip your bad, a priest raping a kid for instance, you're golden. Well this only makes your religion look worse. My question only posited morality doesn't exist for you people. What you're saying is that not only does it not exist, but God has actually given you permission to do the most horrendous deeds your minds can conceive. He states that this is the thing he's noticed in the past, this burning up of good deeds, which we now know do not even exist. How exactly did do you notice this? What does that even mean? Are you the only one that noticed? Or is every Christian? Is this written in your Bible, or did you just make that up? Because if it's not written in your Bible, I don't want to hear it. A uh, Christian enjoys the presence of God. Now God is very good. Um, so the gifts of God are so good. And if you have a moral lapse, that's the person, that good one, is the person from whom you are separating, you are departing. Okay? It says, let there not be found in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. What the fuck? The bad you splits away from the good you. What, are you talking about your soul now? Is your soul a split personality? Do you have two of them? So when a Christian chooses to sin, you've got to have unbelief first. For a Christian to sin, they've got to have unbelief first. 
Please explain that one. Sounds to me like you're saying Christians don't sin. That the second you turned and looked at that woman's ass, you became a non-Christian. And the second your eyes left her bottom, you became a Christian again. That in itself states that not only does morality not exist, but neither does sin itself. There is nothing for you to be forgiven for if you're a Christian, because all sin washes off you a nanosecond after you committed the non-existent sin. The only thing you would be in need of forgiveness for is your momentary lapse into atheism, if sin existed. But the second you are Christian again, what? You've got to say to Jesus, well, I know, Lord, you say this, but I want to do that. I think this is going to be better for me. And so you go off and you depart. But you have just left that one who is the source of your joy. So that's a punishment in and of itself. That's a really, that's a severe punishment. And when you depart from that part of you reveling in the joy of God to do evil, you're leaving that one that brings you joy. Huh? Meaning your God, I would assume. And that's a punishment in itself. You're comparing looking at a woman's ass for two seconds to being tortured by a depraved psychopath for all eternity. Are you delusional? Remember this? I will still go to heaven, but I will suffer. That's the suffering this guy is talking about when he says walking away from his God is a punishment in itself. A severe punishment. The punishment you feel in your heart that you're doing the wrong thing. No, pal, we call that guilt. You're feeling guilty for having done something wrong. People are being tortured by your sociopathic God, and a guilty conscience is your measure for your misdeeds? Oh, screw you. You're essentially calling life itself a punishment, because that's all you're describing. Nothing special has happened to you. You weren't suffering. You were simply in the middle of existence and decided to give it a name. Magic. When I got saved, at first I thought, wow, you know, all my, my shame and my guilt has been taken away from me, so now I'm clean, and I've got, like, strength and power. You know, I can use that to advance all of my personal goals so much. <laughs> you know, and it, it was basically right then that, I, that the Lord corrected me. And I know, you know, Jesus didn't save me so that I could accomplish my goals. Jesus saved me so that I could serve him. Jesus saved you to serve him. How exactly are you supposed to serve Jesus? Last I heard, you're supposed to give all your possessions away. All your money, everything you have, leave your job, your life, your family, lock yourself in a closet and pray till you die of starvation. Is that your place you're sitting in? It's a nice shirt you're wearing there. Those shades on your windows look expensive. What exactly does your God consider rich? 300 bucks, 10,000, a million? And he would provide for me and take care of me. How does Jesus provide for you? I mean, specifically. Do you work, get a paycheck? Did Jesus interview you for your job? And what exactly is so special about you while thousands of other Christians around the world starve, get raped, die in earthquakes, and waste away in hospital beds? Are you saying Jesus has taken care of those people too? But now I was called to be a soldier of Christ Jesus, not to just do my own thing. Why can't you do your own thing? Jesus is doing it. So is your God. Aborting millions of babies through miscarriages, children abused, people being tortured by others somewhere in this world as we speak. I, I've been brought into a family. Brought into a family you wouldn't hesitate to slaughter in a second if your God told you to. And they would be more than happy to boil you in oil to show your Jesus how much they love it. Along with your infant daughter, the witch. So I'm family, and don't tell me your God wouldn't order the death of children. I'm sure you remember the part about slicing open pregnant women, aborting their babies by ripping them out of their bellies and bashing them to death against stones. Yeah, butchering babies. That's so moral it's got me wanting to sign up right now. And please don't attempt to justify mass murder to me by saying your God knew those kids would grow up non-believers. So that's why it had them killed. If they knew that, then they knew all those people would be born non-believers. So why did it allow them to be born? So my purpose in existence is to serve God. Your purpose in existence is to serve God, huh? Why? What does a perfect being want or need your worship for? What is your worship doing for it? All right, the worship is for your benefit, to get you into heaven. How do you get into heaven? It's impossible, so it gave you Jesus. So you can sacrifice your own child to God. 
as long as you believe in Jesus, you go to heaven. You're failing miserably. Please get to something. Now, if I go a different way and go into sin, I have separated, I, I, in a sense, I, I, I'm separated from God. Now, not, not really in that I'm still saved, but I'm abiding in my dead nature. I'm, I'm living as if, I, as if I weren't saved. If I go a different way, I'm separated from God, but not really, because I'm still saved, although I'm separated. When you see, I'm a divided being. You see, there's the me, the me, me, and the not so me. We're all different aspects of the same me, but we're different. You see, the me is not the me, me, as it's not the me that's the not so me. But we're the same me, although none of them are me. Get it? So I can't serve God. I can't, I'm, I'm useless to God. You're useless to God in that case. Before you can become useless to God, you have to be useful to it. But what use are you to an all-powerful being that needs nothing, that wants nothing, that desires nothing, because it is everything? The hell did this thing create you for? To serve it? How? For what? What can you do for this thing? It doesn't need, want, desire your worship. Your prayers fall on deaf ears. There's no need for you. Your worship is pointless, meaningless, and serves no end. To get you into heaven is all you have. Why didn't they just put you there? Like, see, I used to play video games all the time. Okay, I used to be addicted to them. That was what I did. Like, among other things. But I, I, spent, I could spend countless hours playing video games. But, you know, when I got saved, it's funny because it's like the Lord opens your eyes and He shows you that's a waste of time. And you claim sitting around all day playing video games is meaningless? while scraping up your knees all day before God is special. That's it. That's God's grand design, to get you into heaven. To what purpose? What is the monumental benefit to the universe of praising God day and night? What is the ultimate destination of this everything? Where are we going to end up at the end of the day? A bunch of people on their knees telling God it's so beautiful and sexy all infinity long, while in between groveling, watching a bunch of other people being tortured, humiliated, and brutalized all infinity long. That's your God's grand design. That's what it's all for. For God to sit on its throne looking down upon the ants, you, praising it to no end while basking in its own vanity as it eats popcorn, watching millions pay the ultimate price for not voting it prom queen. While in between those two final destinations, there is nothing but struggle, pain, murder, genocide, disease, and natural disaster. All to end in a final destruction of all we see. Countless death, limitless war, hate, and misery. And that's only the first three pages of your Bible. Your religion is a cult of death, a hateful bunch of trash. Video games are a waste of time. Ripping open pregnant women is what you prefer. If you're going to sit there and tell me that playing video games excessively is harming the world, but stoning women that have been raped to death makes it better, you deserve your putrid God because you're one of a kind. That's a bondage. That's a prison. And that's a problem. And Jesus sets you free from those things. Jesus sets you free from bondage? What would happen to you if you became a non-believer then? What would your loving, fairy godfather in the sky do to you? I can't spend that long playing a video game because it's just present in my mind that it's vain. Can't spend time on games because it's vain. What's wrong with vanity? It's your God's most specialized trait. I thought you wanted to be like your God. I thought that was the point. All I hear is your God talking about itself. Love me. I am love. I am the greatest thing that ever lived and was ever loved. You are nothing to me. I can kill you with the flick of a finger because you're shit and I'm the man. Worship me. Worship it, that's the definition of vanity. You worship vanity. You've devoted your life to vanity. You see, before you're saved, though, you probably engaged in, in, in vain things. But the devil kind of puts, he brings down this boom, he brings down this darkness over you. So it's like you're doing it, but you just never think about the fact that it's pointless. The devil? Seriously? You're going to bring up that thing? I've heard of a lot of devils. The devil is torturing people. The devil is in hell being tortured itself. Hell was built for the devil, but it hasn't been built yet because God's allowing it to have free reign to destroy and kill. I don't know which devil you're talking about, but it sounds like the one with mind powers and makes you do stupid shit. It brings down this pall over you. No wonder you people follow a religion with no respect for anything. You can't take responsibility for your own actions. Your adult children. Now it's the devil making you do it. You started by saying when a Christian sins, he's splitting away from something or other. Now it's the devil splitting him. Well, if the devil is lowering the boom on you, what the hell are you feeling guilty about? 
You're blameless and your God knows this. Can't you people accept responsibility for your own actions and stop scapegoating invisible pixies? Do you realize how pathetic you people are? How sad you sound? You just, you just never think about it. It's like somebody who's like a, always seeking more money, you know? And they're doing all this scheming to get more money, get more power, get more, you know, this and that and the other, right? More, more, more. You know, they've got billions, but they need billions more. And it's like, but you're going to die. So that person is in darkness because they're not able to see the fundamental vanity of what they're doing, of what they're devoting their whole life to. But a Christian sees it. I turned to the Lord um, because I didn't want to to go, I didn't want to be that anymore. But if I go back to it, my last state is going to be worse than my first. In other words, it'll be worse for me than, than it was back when I wanted to depart from it and came to Christ in the beginning. Now, will I still go to heaven? Yes, I will, because I'm born again and I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. But, you know, like if, if things get too bad, He can kill you and, and take you home. Because um, rather than lose you, He'll end your life on earth to bring you home. He can kill you. He can kill me if things get too bad. More death, your God's favorite pastor. Religious people talk of killing and murder and torture like it's the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. No empathy in your stone cold hearts. Where does your God get off killing you? Me, anyone. Why are you giving it that power? Why does your God kill you? What it made you so it can kill you? Is that your answer? It kills us because it can. Because it has the power. And all you're talking about is survival of the fittest. The weak shall die and the strong shall live. A grizzly bear can kill you too. Your God is that grizzly bear. Taking what it wants from you and leaving scraps left. I'm not asking you, can your God kill you? I'm asking you why it kills you. Anybody can kill, you can kill. That doesn't answer anything. You may say, no, I can't kill. My God forbids it. Do you believe in the death penalty? Did you know your God sanctions the state to execute people? Don't give me you can't kill. Rather than lose you, he'll end your life on earth and bring you home. And your God is going to do this killing as to not lose you. Take you home, you said, if it gets too bad. It loves you so much it'll do you the favor of murder. Really? Am mind telling me why I'm still here? How bad can it get for your God to have its most beloved become an atheist? I know. Someone worshipping a different God. Mind telling me why the Hindus aren't dropping like flies? Why aren't the streets waist deep in bodies? I mean, how bad does it have to get before your God sprinkles down the magic fairy dust on somebody? Think possibly if a bunch of Muslims were plotting to blow up a bunch of Christians would be enough? Shit, man, I came into this knowing Christians were a bunch of lying, amoral hypocrites that worship an immoral fantasy. I came away not only knowing that, but that sin, your favorite catchphrase, doesn't even exist, and that your only reason for being is to worship your God. This world doesn't matter. You have no obligations to your fellow man, creatures, or this planet. It placed you here to stroke its ego, so you can get into heaven to stroke its cock before it goes to bed to the soothing sounds of torture. All who made it to heaven, in a long, revolving, never-ending conga line to slobber on your God's knob. And while you wait for your turn to blow it, you're glorifying it till you go hoarse. You have carte blanche to do anything to anyone you please. And because that's what you want to do, as Christian history more than demonstrates, you've invented a way to absolve yourselves of all culpability and reconcile that annoying conscience of yours. You invented the devil, a being that is the cause of you deserting your kids. But that wasn't enough. You came up with Jesus to do his hocus pocus rain dance to wipe your sweaty asses dry. So your God is going to murder and torture you for something someone else did. Adam. And it created Jesus to forgive you for something something else made you do. Am I getting the gist of this stupid garbage? <sighs> you answered my question. Nothing happens to you for anything after you die. Only in this world does your God do anything to you. The same stuff he does to everyone else. Making your life in this existence meaningless. Your works in the name of Christ, as you put it, have no effect on this world. This world can never be changed by your works or any other Christians. So the bottom line is this. You're an amoral person. 
You would kill your entire family in their sleep if told. Morality doesn't exist, neither does sin, which means there is no good, meaning there is no bad, meaning your life's belief system is a sham. Everything you believe is of importance in this world is meaningless, because this world is of no consequence to your God. Animoral, hate-filled, vain, mass-murdering, impotent egotist. This is all you have revealed to me. This assault on my ears and being have washed me clean of all tolerance for your religion. So, um, I hope this encourages you to accept the fact that humanity is all you have to count on. And to believe in secular humanism. Because we would never ask you to torture and murder your child. And that no one can forgive you for the evil you've perpetrated, but the person you perpetrated against. Jesus means never having to say you're sorry. But telling someone you're sorry can free you immensely bring you into a new form of well-being. And no one has to be tortured, murdered, and sacrificed on a burning pyre for that. It's free. And the only consequence for it are healed feelings. Also, all the evolution stuff. It's happening in the only way it can. But don't get me started on that. We need to teach our kids their actions have consequences and that they alone are responsible for their behavior. That if they want to get along with their fellow man, and woman, that they must be willing to compromise certain selfish tendencies. So I hope this enlightens you to the truth of the world, of true existence and substance. May your time in this world be joyous and just remember, love isn't torture.